The beauty of Euler's formula, probably the single most beautiful equation in math, is one that unites trigonometry with concepts like Euler's number and the imaginary number. Yes, you guessed it right, it is Euler's formula. But what I want to do in this video is to build a step-by-step -step intuition of all the symbols involved and how the formula is derived using them. But what is E? So, first off, we'll understand where Euler's number E comes from. Let's take the example of bacteria growth. Say you record the population size for some time t. This is the function n of t. If bacterial population doubles every hour, we see this trend. In the first hour, we have two bacteria, then four, then eight, and so on for infinitely large values of t. What if bacteria didn't wait for the whole hour to double? Instead of one big doubling, let's assume they grow in smaller steps. This means the population is growing smoothly rather than in discrete jumps. Let's say that every half hour, instead of doubling, they grow by a smaller fraction. Since in one full hour they should still roughly double, each half hour should increase the population by one plus one half. After one full hour, two half hour periods, the population is, if we divide time into three intervals of 20 minutes, uh, then the bacteria grow by each step. After one full hour, as we increase n, making the growth happen more continuously, let's compute some values. We can go on and continuously divide the smallest measured unit time to infinitely smaller times. As n tends to infinity, the value of 1 plus 1 over n to the power of n computes closer and closer to 2.71828. This process shows that E is the natural limit of continuous growth. If bacteria didn't grow in jumps but instead grew smoothly at every instant, their population would naturally evolve according to ET, where it is time. This is why E appears in finance, compound interest, physics, radioactive decay, AI, gradient descent, and even neural networks. It governs processes where change builds upon itself continuously. So, bringing our original equation into context now, we have seen off E and developed a pretty rigorous proof for its value. But what on earth is that symbol I? So, let's take a moment to develop an intuitive understanding of I. In his 1545 book Ars Magna, Cardano solved cubic equations of the form. While solving, he encountered... We'll explore this later on. Cardano dismissed it as sophistic, meaning nonsensical. However, he acknowledged that such expressions could lead to real solutions, hinting at the utility of imaginary numbers. However, it wasn't until 1572 when Raphael Bombelli formalized rules for what he called complex numbers. These were given the form where the root of negative 1 times b is the imaginary part and a is the real part. Further discoveries, such as in 1806 by Jean-Robert Argon, clarified much of the myth around these complex numbers. We can represent complex numbers on an Argon diagram, with an imaginary axis in place of y and a real axis in place of x. The value of a corresponds to the real axis, and the value of b matches the imaginary axis. These complex numbers can be added, multiplied, divided, and subtracted in the same normal way as real numbers are dealt with. Only this time, i is treated as a variable. A complex conjugate is the same complex number, but with the opposite associated with its imaginary part. Take the example of 3 plus i. Its complex conjugate would be 3 minus i. Together, they form what is called a complex conjugate pair. What is interesting, though, is that if you multiply both these conjugates together, the i multiplies to form negative i squared. And i squared as we know it is equal to negative 1. Thus, it gives us a real result. These key discoveries redefined mathematics. Solutions involving negative roots could now be used to obtain real roots of a cubic equation. So, let's go through some applications of this. BTW, before we head on to the applications, let us finish off the problem we were solving with Cardano's cubic. Let's take Cardano's original problem. The general form of a depressed cubic is, however, at first glance, the root of negative 121 seems to make no sense, but it can be simplified to 11i. A few more steps in the process would lead to our final real solution where x equals 4. I
The application of imaginary numbers isn't just limited to solving cubic equations. Rather, it can be applied to a whole variety of different problems. Don't feel blown off by this section, as it is just to emphasize how vastly useful imaginary numbers are in modern physics and maths. The behavior of particles in quantum mechanics is defined by Erwin Schrödinger's famous wave function and is complex valued. The equation for a particle in one dimension is given by this fairly complex equation. Where is the wave function? Planck's constant is mass and potential energy. The wave function is complex, but the probability density which defines how likely it is to find a particle at a given position is a real number. Another major branch of physics and engineering involves the analysis of signals comprising multiple sinusoidal waves and often requires complex numbers. Yes, you probably guessed this one. It is the Fourier transform of a signal. But do you notice something in this Fourier transform? We have e to the power of negative i times w. But what could it mean to have something to the power of negative 1? Makes no sense, right? Let's bring back that argon diagram we saw earlier. Multiplying i by itself results in a 90-degree transformation of the function. If we continue for four values, we get a circle, more specifically a unit circle. This is because each point is a unit's distance from the center. Using some clever trigonometry, we can derive that the sine of theta is just equal to the opposite side, as opposite over the hypotenuse results in opposite over 1. The same logic applies to the cosine of theta, but this time, cosine of theta is equal to the adjacent side. Another key thing to note is that, since arc length is found by the formula L equals R times theta, and we know that R, the radius, is just 1, the angle theta in radians must be equal to the arc length. Therefore, we can represent any complex number in terms of the opposite and adjacent sides of our right-angled triangle. The opposite side of our right-angled triangle depicts the imaginary part and the adjacent side depicts our real part. So, using the original form of complex numbers a plus bi, we can rewrite our equation for a complex number in terms of trigonometric functions to give us